Psalm 130. We're going to keep marching to Zion, if you will. Amen. Psalm 130. We've been studying these psalms of degrees. And uh, from a human standpoint, I kind of fell on this by accident. The, we know in God's economy there's no accident. But again, these psalms were the songbook of the Hebrew people, and they would sing these songs as they ascended to the temple to worship. And uh, we, like they, are making our way up to the temple. I don't know what I'm going to do when we get there. I, I, I really would like to, honestly, and I, I'm, I'm being as honest as I can be, I really would love to take some services and, and teach on like the tabernacle and the temple. Mm -hmm. And every time I sit down and start to look at that, it's overwhelming mm -hmm. to me. Uh, but it would be a wonderful, a wonderful study and maybe the Lord will help me do that sometime uh, in the near future. But Psalm 130 is the number six of seven uh, Psalms that are penitent, penitential. Boy, you know what I'm talking about. My uh, the words are not coming well this evening. So the and and you know we've looked at these psalms and and I I'm not so sure that I don't agree with some of the guys that I have read after that these psalms have been written by Hezekiah. They line up with events that were taking place in his life and the, the life of Israel. And it's been it's been a really it's been a really good study for me. I've really enjoyed it. But if if Hezekiah truly is our writer, he's pouring out his heart to God. He's confessing sin on both personal and a public level. When was the last time you heard of somebody when they prayed and they confessed their own sin and the sins of the nation? I mean, when I think about that, I think about Nehemiah. You know, Nehemiah went and explored the ruins of the city, and what did he do? He cried out to God, and he confessed his own sin, and he confessed the sins of his nation. And, and the day and hour that we live in, I hate to say it, but... So many Christians don't even seem like they care that much about their own sin, let alone the sin of the nation. I mean, there are people who say that are they're Christians, yet they are endorsing things that God clearly does not endorse. They're endorsing things that the Bible has clear black and white principles against them, and people who so-called Christians are saying, that's all right. And it's not. God has not changed his mind about these things. Amen. If it was sin then, it is sin now, and it will be sin in the future. Amen. So the world doesn't know many individuals who will get on their face before God and pour out their heart to him make intercession who will confess their own sin, forsake their own sin, let alone the sin of the nation. We're guilty by association. We don't like to hear that. The world will never know until they stand before God the debt that they owe Christians. And in my mind, when I make that statement, I think about little grandmas in their prayer closet. Little mamas in their prayer closet, knelt down beside their little bed, tears running out of the down their cheeks, making intercession for children and grandchildren, friends and neighbors. I remember, I remember when my grandmother passed away, and you know what the thing I remember the most about it? The void, not just the void that I felt that she was gone, but the void that I felt her prayers were gone. Mm -hmm. She wasn't 
interceding for me anymore. It was the same thing when, when my mom's middle sister passed away. And I knew she was one of my faithful prayer warriors. But I, and y'all can call me nuts, I don't care. Because I know, I know the void that I felt in my ministry mm -hmm. and in my life when these two gals went to heaven. And they were not interceding for me anymore. But thank God we have God the Holy Ghost who ever liveth to make intercession for us. And he does constantly. Yes, sir. But I'm telling you, the world doesn't realize it, but they owe a debt to godly Christian people that will get on their face before God and make intercession for the nation. Yes, sir. I wonder what it's going to be like in heaven. Maybe somebody, and, and this is just me thinking out loud. What's it going to be like? We're standing there, and somebody that we don't know comes up to us and says, you know, I got saved because of you. Mm -hmm. Am I going to be like, who are you? Mm -hmm. There's, in all the years of the fair ministry, I won a lot of people to Christ. I didn't know them. I didn't know them when they left. But I had the privilege to take the Bible and show them how to be saved. Right. If we have a, an enormous responsibility to pray and to pray for our nation. I guess this is heavy on my heart because 4th of July is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. We should be we should be making intercession for America. Yep. This Psalm 130 is divided into two parts. In the first part is, is verses 1 to 6. So let's read this first part and I'll pray and, and we'll get going. The psalmist says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to be back in your house tonight. Thank you for your word and the encouragement that it is to us. And Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to fall deeper in love with your word every day. I pray that you would help us to make a habit of reading it every day and not just reading it but studying it memorizing it and sharing it and most importantly help us to obey it now father tonight you know i need your help there's no way in this world that in and of myself i can accomplish what needs to be accomplished here tonight but through the precious holy ghost of god your will can be accomplished and i pray for that tonight bless your word in our time together in jesus name amen so in these first six verses, the writer is giving to us his personal experience. And we see in verse 1, we see his desperate condition. He says, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. When I, when I read that, I mean, what do you think about when you hear that? Out of the depths have I cried. First place my mind went was the belly of a fish. Jonah. He was in the depths. And what well, the Bible tells us that he cried to the Lord and what? That fish got an upset stomach. Mm -hmm. He cried to the Lord out of the depths. But see, church, we need to make crying out to the Lord a habit, not a life preserver. Mm -hmm. Isn't that how we operate? I mean, everything is, I mean, it's smooth sailing. Everything's going our way. I mean, we're, we're, we're running down the road wide open. We're enjoying life. And then the bottom falls out. And what do we do? Oh, Lord, save me, help me. If you'll get me out of this, I'll go to Africa. I'll do this, I'll do that. But here's the, here's the great thing. 
just like the psalmist here in verse 1, when the bottom falls out, we do have an advocate. We do have a place that we can go in prayer and we can get help. And he says, out of the depths have I cried. That literally means the deeps, the bottom. Man, when I read that, I, my mind immediately went to Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Amen. The, the writer of Psalm 121 could look up to the hills. Why? Because he was in the valley. I mean, if I'm on the mountaintop, I can look up. But I'm not going to see the mountaintops. What am I going to see? I'm going to see the heavens, the clouds, the sky. But when we're in the valley, we need to look up. Too many times when we get in the valley, what do we do? I mean, we're lower than a well digger's shoe. And hey, there's time to weep. There's the time to mourn. Solomon tells us that in Ecclesiastes. But I'm here to tell you, when we're, when we're down in the depths, our focus needs to be uh, yes. needs to be on him. That's right. Yeah. If I remember right, it was a, I don't remember which ladies' conference it was, but Miss Tara went to one of the ladies' conferences. And she came home and she said, you know, I learned something. I said, okay, what? She said, it's not all about me. I said, that's a joke in our house now. But hey, when we're in the depth, it's difficult to focus away from where we're at. That's right, amen. And if we can just get our focus off of here, yeah. up to here, That's right. change everything. Mm -hmm. It may not change our circumstances, but it will sure change how we deal with our circumstances. That's right. yeah. It will change so much about the situation. It may not take away the pain, but it will help us deal with the pain. It may not take away the heartache, but it will help us deal with the heartache. When we, we've got to We've got an eye problem in this country. Yep. We're looking at the wrong stuff. That's right. We're looking here, and we should be looking here. Mm -hmm. And I know this is easy preaching, but it's not easy living. So I'm preaching to, to the pastor tonight as much or more than I am anybody else. He said, out of the depth have I cried. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. The, the psalmist, through the book of Psalms, he talks about many times that the, the Lord inclines his ear to me. You know what that means? It means he does this. It's like the word mercy. Mercy means to stoop down and to help an inferior. Mm -hmm. If a child speaks to me, no better than my hearing is, you're going to see me. And I'm still trying to read lips because I still can't hear them. Yeah. Unless they're shouting at me. And then I can't understand them because they're shouting at me. You'll understand all this when you all get old. Lord, hear my voice. Man, when I read that, the first thing I thought about was a, was a mom and her kids. There could be 300 kids in a room, screaming, yelling, running. But the minute her child whispers, what? It's us. We attract this kind of stuff all the time. It's us. BRT, dead right there. Doesn't look like a woodpecker this time. I don't know what it is about this church and animals. We've had bats in the sanctuary. We've had birds in the fellowship hall. 
And now they're trying to get in and worship with us. Anyway, so he's talking about these first, first six verses, his personal experience. And there is not a person here tonight that does not understand probably what the psalmist is talking about. Verse 3, he said, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? I thought it was interesting. I looked at that word mark, and that word mark means to hedge in. In other words, if you were keeping track of all my sins and iniquities, I'm sunk. But the great thing is, now we're in the New Testament. We have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we confess those sins, the psalm tells us he puts our sin into the deepest part of the sea. They're gone. He remembers them no more. Now the dirty dog devil will bring them up to you and remind you about them. But when you talk to, when you talk to the Lord about it after you've already confessed it, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Verse 4, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Our God is a God of forgiveness. Yes, There's so many people out there that are running around unforgiven. Yes. I remember hearing a national preacher one time on the radio, and he was talking about he was in a preaching in another city, and him and one of his staff members were, were together in that city. And he said, we just decided that we were going to slip away and go to a movie. Man. Anyway, so what did they go see? They went to see a movie entitled Unforgiven. Mm -hmm. And he said after they left, he said, I thought it was a terrible movie. Duh. <laughs> he said, but then I began to reflect on that. And he said, really and truthfully, that movie was all about what it's like. About life living your life being unforgiven. Right. I mean, you're carrying all of that burden, all of that care, and you don't have to. That's right. You know, God has designed us to only be able to shoulder and carry so much. But you know why he did that? He did that in mercy because he wants us to come to him and what does Peter say? Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. I have a, a cousin who used to call me all the time, and she was always on something when she would call. And she, she'd she always tell me, I love the Bible, too. God will give me more than I can I can bear. I said, no, that's not what the Bible says. No, it is. The Bible says there is no temptation taking you, but such as a common man. But God will with that temptation provide a way that you may escape. That's what it's talking about. It's not... No, he, I, and I told her time and time and time again, God will pour on you far more than you can handle because he's trying to push you to him. That's right, amen. Because he loves you supremely. He's not doing it to you, he's doing it for you. Yeah. But you see, we get this, this, it's all about me. Why is God doing this to me? He's not doing it to me, he's doing it for me. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared, respected. Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Oh, wait, nobody likes to wait. Waiting, waiting in God's economy is not sitting in the recliner with your feet up, and the remote in your hand, watching TV, waiting on your next show to come on. And some people have that idea of waiting. Waiting, when I think of waiting in the Bible, you know what I think about? I think about that athlete, man, woman, boy, or girl, doesn't matter, on the line, getting ready to do a 100-yard dash. No, I'm not going to demonstrate it because we'd have to call a record and get me up off the floor if I did. But you know what I'm talking about. They get up on the line, they put their hands down, and they got one foot front and one foot back. And what happens? The gun goes pow. They don't go. No. Boom! They're gone. That's right. 
That's Bible waiting. This is not Bible waiting. We're waiting, but we're ready to go. We're Christian men and men and women. Ready at a moment's notice. When I worked at the fairs, people would tell me that they knew for sure that they would go to heaven when they would die. The, the very next thing I would ask them is, can you tell me how? And you would be, I, I was amazed at the number of people would be like, uh, 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 well, um, yeah, it's in the Bible. Good start. And I'd say, hey, if you were going to leave the Indiana State Fairgrounds and you were going to go to Chicago, would you just get your car and drive? I mean, you would know the route you wanted to, unless you're us, and we're different. What am I doing? I'm trying to get them to understand. If you're really going, then you should know the way to get there. That's right. You don't go to heaven like we go on vacation. Which direction do you want to go? I don't know. Sounds good to me. Okay, here we go. None of you folks would ever want to go on vacation with us. <laughs> but you know the thing I love about this forgiveness that he's talking about in verse 4 is that it is sure forgiveness. Yes, sir. It's sure forgiveness. You know, I can ask my wife to forgive me. She can ask me to forgive her. And we can forgive one another. But if in two years, one of us says, you remember that time you... Not really forgive. Sure, forgiveness. We have been promised, again, 1 John 1, 9. I thought this was an interesting illustration. Uh, Dr. G. Campbell Morgan went to Wales to see the Welsh revival for himself. He heard a Welshman praying in English. He was praying in English, but thinking in his native tongue, translating as he went along. He started to quote these words, there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. But he stumbled at the second line. After one or two attempts to express the idea, he put it like this, O oh Lord, we thank thee that there is forgiveness with thee enough to frighten us. Oops. But isn't that the reality of it? Sin should frighten us. Yes, it should. But it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, if I saw a snake out there in the yard, I wouldn't be out there playing with it. I have one reaction, and since we're, this is going out on social media, I will not divulge what reaction that would be, but it would not be pretty. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> then we see in verses 5 and 6, we see that the, the psalmist is determined. He's determined. Verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Waiting is not easy. When I read that, my mind went right back to King Saul. Samuel told him, you wait for me, I will come and do the sacrifice. And what did he do? Oh, Doesn't he know I'm the king? I'm on a time schedule. Come on, let's, let's, let's get this thing going. And would you know it, just like the way God operated, as soon as that thing got started, guess who showed up? Samuel. And it was Saul's sin of disobedience that, that caused him to lose the kingdom. God said, wait. It's spiritual exercise. He said in verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Again, the expectation of future good. There is nothing we could do but 
wait. And again, waiting is an active thing. As we wait, we pray. As we wait, we read the Word of God. There are things that we can do while we wait. It's not just laying around lazy, but it is, a, it is something we should be actively doing while we wait and quit trying to force things. That's true. Boy, do I need to learn that. Verse 6 talks about the expectation. Who's he waiting for? My soul waited for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. <clears throat> Secondly, we see the public exhortation in verses 7 and 8. The psalmist here concludes by pressing home to us the conscience of his nation, the need for personal and national relationship with God. Again, one thing we have been talking about through this series is that Israel is God's chosen people. That's right. yes. Because of their unbelief, he has set them aside, but he, the Jews, will be saved. The Bible teaches that. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the tribulation about. The tribulation is those seven weeks of years. It's for the Jews. They owe that to God. It has nothing to do with the church. The church will not be here. And it, it, it's wearisome sometimes talking to some of these, I don't say closet theologians, but with the advent of social media, they're coming out of the closet like a flood. You might need to lock the door. That's true. But I mean, you've got people out there, they've got the church everywhere in God's uh, prophetic scheme. The church. The church leaves. We do not see the tribulation. That's right. We are. We believe in a pre-millennial, pre-tribulational rapture. Period. And so, our hope is in the Lord. It, it, Paul tells us in Romans chapter eight that. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. We don't, when we know Christ is our Savior, we don't have to face this kind of stuff. And, and, and again, you've got, you've, got all, you've got these false teachers out here trying to, trying to put the church in places that the church has no business being in the, in the grand scheme of things. But thank God we don't have to go through that. Jesus Christ took that on the cross. Verse 8 tells us that our help is where? In the Lord. And he shall what? Redeem Israel from all his iniquity. The psalmist again put his finger right on the problem. It's a sin problem. Yes. It's a sin problem for them just like it's a sin problem for us. Mm -hmm. I don't get these sinless perfection people. Well, I haven't sinned in years. <laughs> so mark her down, Tolkien, you just did. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. So thank God for forgiveness. Yes. And all we have to do is ask. Just ask. We don't like to humble ourselves because of our pride and admit that we're wrong. That's all it takes. I was somewhere the other day and we were having a discussion about people being out in open sin. And the thought came to my mind, yeah, but all it takes is to stop and take that step to turn around. For those of us who have prodigals, that's what we need to we need to pray that they our prodigals will have a dawning like the prodigal in Luke chapter 15 and will come home, get their heart right with God and come home. But be encouraged tonight, no matter where we're at in this life, maybe we're in the depths, maybe, maybe you're on the mountaintop, maybe you're somewhere in between. It does not matter. Our God 
is a simple prayer away. Mm -hmm. And when we're in the valley, look up. Especially this day and hour, because of our redemption is drawing Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to be in your house this evening.